Reflections with theologian Father James Basic, lecturer and campus minister at the University of Toledo. Yeah, Martin Luther King said that at one time, unless there's something you're willing to die for, you're already dead. Today on Reflections, Father Basic talks with Mr. Robert Anderson, an organizational and leadership consultant. The topic of this week's Reflections is leadership, suffering for the cause. And now, here is Father Basic. Bob, I enjoy uh, speaking with you. You're a good uh, dialogue partner. Uh, and uh, I'd like to talk a little bit with you about leadership because you certainly have put a lot of your time and effort into that question lately. Uh, I noticed that you do uh, a good deal of reading on the topic. Do you try to stay up with the literature that's coming out? I try to stay up with it, and it's very hard. <laughs> well, there's, a there's a lot of books lot, being written. There's a written. lot out coming. And it's, just, it's kind of the hot topic right now. Right, and articles written about yep. it and so on. Yep. The people are interested in it from varying angles. There's people working their way up to corporate structure who yep. want to figure out how to do it better. Uh, there's a lot of our service uh, industries that uh, figure out we better f sure. find a better way to deal with the clients that we're trying to help, and that becomes a leadership kind of question. Yeah. We find it in my own circles in the church world, a lot of interest in this, uh, and it comes uh, from a number of angles. For one, uh, priests who function as pastors or co-pastors uh, in parishes, uh, associate pastors are trying to figure out how to do their job better. They've got all kind of new pressures upon them, a new world that many of them are not prepared for, and so they have to retool, rethink, so they can become more effective leaders. But then that's multiplied by the fact that we have so many lay leaders in the church these mm -hmm. days, pastoral administrators and uh, pastoral associates and people in, in leadership roles in religious education and so on, and uh, they are trying to figure out how they fit into the larger church structure and how they're going to help other people, how they're going to empower others to use their own gifts. So we've got uh, the question of leadership coming at us from many angles this way, and I think that a lot of the insights from the secular world and the church world really coalesce, and we can use those. I think we can talk about both of them at once, really. So I'd like to talk about leadership in a particular way. I can see doing it in many ways. You can talk about leadership in terms of vision. The leader has to have vision. Where are we going? What's our dream? How do? And then we could talk about it as important. Empowerment. The leader ought to try to empower others and, and help them to take hold and make their contribution. And also, I think there's a way from our scriptural side, the biblical imagery, that leaders are supposed to be servants. And so maybe we could begin to talk about that in greater depth here. What does it mean to say that a leader would be a servant on the model of Jesus, the suffering servant? You want to comment on that at all? Well, the first the first image for me that comes to mind is that you know when I think of Christ uh, that's what he did he served he he uh, he served mostly uh, by trying to bring out uh, the, the goodness the, the love the capability the greatness that was inherent in the people that he met and I think that and that's to me central to leadership is to be of service to people I notice that uh, in the New Testament that becomes one of the favorite images for Jesus when the biblical writers tried to figure out, well, who is he and how yeah. will I explain who is? They went back to Isaiah and the great suffering servant songs found in uh, the book of Isaiah. And it talked about this one who would sort of uh, take on the sufferings of his people, who would try to lead them by an example of uh, being humble mm -hmm. before the great God. And uh, it, it's a marvelous image of the suffering servant. And that was immediately when they looked at the life of Jesus and how will we explain this? Who is he? That, that was one of their prime ones. Jesus is the suffering servant. Yeah. I often imagine Jesus in this way, uh, sort of doing his prayers and meditating on the, the Hebrew scriptures, which form the base of his, of his own religious outlook. And he comes upon Isaiah and he reads about the suffering servant, the four great poems or hymns that we find there. And he says, that's a good way to live. I'll try to live like that. And, and he, he begins to live out that ideal and at some point he says I am the suffering servant that's my own imaginative recreation mm -hmm. but I think it makes the point of how central that idea was to the whole identity of Jesus I will suffer for my people I'm willing to put myself on the line for the cause of the kingdom of God mm -hmm. and to lead and empower my people yeah and to lead is often to lay your life down and, and in two ways I think about that it's one is to give myself fully to, to what I love, to what I care about. It's that there's a 
there's a passion about uh, making a contribution to people's lives, uh, to customers, to whoever, to, to parishioners that, that pervades. And it's, I give my life to that. I lay it down in service of, of people's humanity in some way. It's not enough to lay it down in the Christian sense for the economic side of the business or the parish or whatever. It's, 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 and we need to be viable. And so it's, it's to lay it down for something which is worthy of my commitment, which is outside of myself to serve, to give, uh, to make the world a better place. Let, let's try to parse that out a little bit and find a language that would make sense uh, in the world as a whole and not just the church. Um, could we try this and say it, one of the great things of life is to have a cause greater than oneself yeah. that really pulls forth my best energy and talent so that I'm not just concerned about me and where I'm going to get yeah. to and moving up, but I really have a cause. Yeah. Uh, Martin Luther King said that at one time, unless there's something you're willing to die for, you're already dead. Yeah. And uh, is there something that we treasure enough to sacrifice for? Maybe that's more, you, you use the term lay your life down for, well, it has a certain gravity to it and yeah. a heaviness. And I wonder, you know, if we, if there isn't a language that people can jump in on better. And I, I'm looking for one that says something about, well, there ought to be something you're willing to sacrifice for. Yeah. What is it that is so worthwhile that you would try to, to do better with it and, and, and give something of yourself and set aside your own interests and needs on occasion yeah. yeah there's two sides of it to me it's lay my life out lay my life down and uh, it's not lay my life down as much as pour my life out for there That's, you go pour it out for it's, yeah. it's 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 Frankel's notion of the will to meaning that there that, that we that we need to confront that 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 and uh, and I think the gospel answer to that what I what what's so touching is is that it's it's a human it's a, it's a, it's a love, a service of others, and their empowerment, their development, their greatness, their capacity to be human. This is what we're challenged to be about. Wherever we are, whether it's church, I think the the the, the what I'm disappointed is, is in in in, in the kind of the Christian tradition. I don't know if it's tradition or as much as the way I see it played out is that we tend to think that's our job when we're at church or when we're involved in church activity, church community. I think it's equally our job in family. I think it's equally our job in the heart of the bureaucracy is to say that that's what I'm about. And that gets me to the second point, which is the suffering side, to lay my life okay, down. Before we go on, can we can we stay with that other mm -hmm. side of it for a while, that idea of pouring oneself out and Victor Frankl's idea and his idea of search for meaning. Uh, I'd, I'd like to, to go with that a little bit more first to make sure we okay. have a real hold on that. Uh, one of the things I know that's big in your own thinking about leadership is that you have to do this in whatever setting you're in that this pouring out, again, I, I'm a little worried that it becomes almost a extraordinary metaphor, but uh, yeah. I, what I want to make sure is that we're seeing that this, uh, whatever we're talking about, leadership ought to go on in the home. In other words, parents ought to be leaders within their own families. Mm -hmm. They ought to be people uh, who give some sense of vision and direction, people who are able to empower their offspring. Okay. I, I'd like to see it, you know, in at the work site uh, of people being able to function as leaders within even a tiny circle and I'd like to see it in the church where I like to talk about multiplying the energy centers within a parish so that you get a whole bunch of energy centers where people's leadership skills can come forward and they can take hold where you have a sort of self-management kind of idea yeah. so whatever this idea is of pouring oneself out or my phrase have a cause bigger than yourself it, it ought to be able to happen at very ordinary ways in all of the yeah. settings of our lives so that yeah. we're there and saying, yeah, there's something worth giving here for. I, I could set aside some of my own needs to make my family work better, or this vacation work better, or yeah. this dinner work better. So that, uh, you know, it could be as simple as saying the parents is uh, spending some time listening well to their kids around the dinner table and are sort of calling them forth in and one way or another. I agree. And we need to discover that. That's our, t it's, it's sort of our task as individuals. Uh, or in community to, to be about the process of discovering that. I think one of the things that I, I've struggled with in my own life is where where's the civil rights movement? Where's the great movement of our time to give my and what I'm beginning to discover is in my family, is in my is in the business, is in this it's it's little ways that where real greatness is required 
you know, I look at I look at, at my wife and and the, the struggle and the work and the energy she pours into the, to to allowing that child to flourish, just allowing that child to flourish. It's a great cause, and it's worthy of her commitment. And I see managers, some of are, you know, under whom people wither and die, and there are other managers around whom people grow and develop and flourish, and and uh, I think that's the notion. Yeah, uh, what you were saying there, even in terms of child rearing, I was thinking, you know, what marvelous, empowering leadership skills are needed there, and what uh, self-sacrifice is brought forth. That's another word that might capture part of what we're talking about here: is self-sacrifice for the greater cause. And I mean, I think the good parents are doing that all the time. Uh, yeah. They're maybe in our culture sometimes doing it too much, uh, and not attending to their own needs, and not uh, ensuring their own personal growth, and just living out of their children or for their children. I think you, yeah. there's a, another side to this question, yeah. but there is a definite call to idealism here that it seems to me to be very important in terms of self-sacrificing, but you got to feel the cause. you got to sense that whatever this larger picture is, it's worthwhile. So uh, you as a parent are saying, well, the cause of helping this child to grow in a healthy way is worth sacrificing. I give up certain things because that is so vitally important, and I can see it, and I have some sense of how I want that youngster to turn out yeah. um, but we need the cause and that, that is is the great problem in the culture very often today is one can't feel the cause now right. let's take it to the corporate world I mean how are you going to tell middle management in the corporate world that they're supposed to you know have a cause what's the cause well what I find is that they that uh, there's a hunger for it there's a deep hunger for meaning and it's uh, it's it's not easily awakened, but it's not impossible. And that there are that, that managers buried in the bureaucracy have have very clear aspirations of how they want people treated, the kind of organization culture, the values that they want to rinse through it. And it's work. If the work of empowering is to help those people begin to discover that for themselves, what is it that I care about that matters enough for me in this organization to be willing? Well, what's a concrete example of that? I mean, what uh, could you, I could start to imagine saying, well, what we would like is greater harmony in this unit here, within this office space That's and right. so on. That Why should people have to come in here every day and be pinned down and hurt and uh, put down? And uh, why can't we make it an enjoyable thing where we all at least like to come in here and we interact in a humane yep. way with one another? And we're even civil when we're in a bad mood or something like that like that. In other words, you could say that, we, that could be a human interesting. Why should we be all cogs in a bureaucracy here in this office? Yeah. When we Why, don't need to be. We don't need to be. Right. So let's uh, get it together here and let's treat each other. We'll get rid of our cliques and we'll have more open things and we'll eat lunch together uh, now and then and we'll, you know, we'll do something about or, raising or, or this Or often up. underneath the tension in a workplace is that nobody's telling the truth about what's really going on. And so what I find a lot is that people care about integrity. They, they want high integrity relationships relationships they want to be honest with each other and they feel compromised because they're carrying around a lot of stuff that's unexpressed that that uh, needs to be talked and so the the cause is to create an honest workplace and to create relationships of integrity where we really can be straight be clear we may not like each other but we we work we're honest and straight and mm -hmm. we may love each other uh, and so those are worthy causes those yeah. are yeah. And, and what a person could see how that could make their life better. I mean, why should they have to come into work just dreading it every morning and saying, no, i got to put up with all those other people who rub me the wrong way and so on? Uh, we would really be better off if we could create a work site that had greater sense of mutuality and harmony. Now, yeah. you can't get into some sort of Marxist idealism here where we think we're going to create the right structures and everything's going to be fine. I mean, one of the things we Christians know is the doctrine of original sin. That is that the human situation situation is flawed and there's temptations in the heart and and we're going to always have people being selfish and greedy so we got to factor that in that's why you know there was a certain note of realism in one of your comments there about well you might not love each other but or even like each other but let's be civil to one another mm -hmm. at, at least that why do we have to make it worse than it than it has to be so i i maybe there's a selling job here that can be done along that line yeah. And I find that there's a there's a lot there that people want a lot more in their work than they currently have. They want a lot more out of their parish than they currently experience. And uh, and uh, central to leadership is to take that seriously. 
I'm going to say I get, I'm going to pour myself off for that. My job is to create it. My job mm -hmm. is to be a vehicle for it coming into being. Allow it to happen. Oh, in yeah. Christian terms, we talk about that as establishing the kingdom. That's right. And the, the, where the reign of God is there, where there are people live in mutuality and respect and in love and peace and where justice really reigns. Now, when you start to take it to the church level, we really ought to be able to sell here a cause that is worthwhile. I mean, that ought to be one of the major things we're able to articulate well. That is, there, there is a cause. And the cause is, let's establish the kingdom. I mean, yeah. let's let this parish in some way replicate, uh, be symbolic of this presence of the Spirit in the world. Let's us be an example of equality. Other people in the world might lord it over or they might uh, try to throw their weight around, but here, let's make it be different. Let's respect one another. Let's say how much money you have doesn't the most important thing about you here or how you dress yeah. or what color your skin is. Let's say yeah. there's something more important about our gathering we have a spirit bond. We have a, we're members of the body of Christ, and there's a mutual respect we have for each other because of, let's create that kind of community here. Yeah, I, I love the way you describe that, and I, the distinction bothers me that there is a distinction between what I'm trying to create in church and what I'm trying to create in my family or in, my, in the work world. And, and to me, the, 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 the Christian focus is I'm trying to create the kingdom not just a church. In fact, church is a support to, the, to, to life. And so the real the tough work is it's hard enough in the church. If we can't do it there, how, how can we do it out, out, out where it's harder, where it's tougher? But the real call, the real call to serve is to go to the world, to go, to go out into the, to the General Motors and the AT&T and, and, and to say, you know, that's a point well taken and a uh, very important theological foundation for that. That is the distinction between the kingdom and the, and the church. The kingdom is the work of God. That is the peace and justice. The church is the sign and the instrument of the kingdom, yep. according to the Second Vatican Council. The church is the servant of the kingdom. But, and the, the kind of comments I was making was the, the suggestion that to the people in the church that what we've got to do is sort of get a feel in our community here for what kingdom living is like. Mm -hmm. Let, let, we got to be able to model it in some way. We got to be able to feel uh, how it would be to live in justice and peace and harmony, so that we know what we're exporting. Absolutely. So we know what we're looking for in the world. Yeah. So we know that well, we can name when we see it in the corporate world, or in the labor union, or at the university, or in the school, the hospital. When we see, in the family, when we see it there, we can name it. Yeah, that's that's what the kingdom looks like. That's what the reign of God's supposed to be, where we've got mutuality, harmony, peace, and justice at yeah. work. Yeah. That's the interaction that I would like to see. Your point, very well taken. The kingdom is a much broader notion, and it really calls forth our efforts in all phases of our life, family, work, recreation, and so on. Yeah, and, and, and where the church is, is really successful. I, I, I work with a lot of well, leaders in various organizations, and I, when I get to know them well, uh, the passion that drives them into, into really doing some significant things in the workplace has been their experience of church, has been the quality of, uh, of, of a community that they experienced at one point or another. I know that's true of my own life. Um, and, and in some ways, that's where the dream was born for me. It's where I see it born for others. Not universally, but it's an important role. I think it is the role, is to awaken the dream. No, it's well said. It. Yes, well said. The, uh, so what we've been trying to look at here is uh, how this uh, sort of larger vision helps us to pour ourselves forth. What we're, what we're getting at is that what leadership ought to do is give people a cause to work for, mm -hmm. the, a, a larger vision that I'm willing to sacrifice for. That's really what, what leadership is called upon to do. And that is a servant kind of leadership that we see uh, uh, really exemplified so clearly in Jesus of Nazareth. I, would, I, I agree with you absolutely that, that, that the w way that I awaken in others the cause is, to, is to, to give it. To, it's like to embody it, to model it, to put it out there. And that causes others to reflect. And I don't want to give you the cause for which to live. My role as leader is for, to help you discover your own cause for which to live. And I, 
I awaken that by my own example. It's who I am that speaks to you, that touches you, and awakens in you, oh, this is what matters to me. So the task for, for me as leader is not to provide you with a cause, but to awaken awaken it within you so that it becomes your cause now. Well, I would suggest cause. that there's sort of a dialectic with yes. that, Bob, that we have to keep in mind. And, and it's always that danger of s being self-serving, of rationalizing, of, of becoming too individualistic, of just going our own way. The dialectic, as I see it, is, is that the leader needs to keep before people is to awaken within and to see what you treasure, mm -hmm. but also to force you, or not maybe a bad word, move you to try to bounce off of a larger vision to bounce off and in our Christian setting that is the kingdom notion or the cause of God or I the like biblical that. image yep. so you keep the dialectic at work and, and, and a good leader is going to be able to do that because sometimes you're working in my corporation here and you got your own vision of where we're going and that might be nice but it doesn't correspond with 98% of the people and Absolutely. therefore you become a thorn in the side of the organization and so Something's we have to, give. we got to call you yeah. to task now Absolutely. you might be able to nudge us and say, wait a second, you know, you, this is a better vision that I've got. That could be. It's also possible that your vision is destructive and we have to challenge it. So you got to have the dialectic between awakening the dream and a larger dream we yeah. bounce off of. Yeah. That's the task of leadership, again, yeah. it seems to me. The servant is able to do that. And it's also, yes, and it's also why I care about this notion of empowerment, that, that to really be in that dialogue, to take that, that's a confrontative stance, your vision, my vision, to really be clear and in dialogue that's, it, that serves both of us uh, so that the truth will out, in a sense, takes a great deal of, of, of empowerment. That if you're the pastor and I'm the parishioner and I feel dependent and I can't confront and I'm not, I give you all that power, then it's not a very uh, good dialogue. And so, so I think you're absolutely right. It's the, it's the willingness to engage in that dialogue that is central to somehow central to uh, uh, my own becoming, my own uh, finding the right cause. Right. Of, uh, and the art of leadership. And itself. the art of leadership. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we, uh, unless you have something more to say about that servant side, I could move to the other side of the image, yeah. and that is the suffering, suffering. servant. Yeah, let's and, do that. Uh, it, it, that begins to raise the question of risk, doesn't it? It also raises the question that's used in a modern context, a, a similar metaphor of the wounded healer. That is, that the leader has mm -hmm. to be the one who has suffered in some way and knows the struggles if he's or she is going to really be effective in calling others forth. So yeah. there's a suffering risk yeah. kind of element in all of this. Yeah. Took Jesus to the cross. He's mm -hmm. the suffering servant because he had to carry the cross. There's a lot of ways you can look at the suffering that leadership goes through and that's in the paper that I wrote it's one of the things I and actually I hadn't thought about and, and enjoyed exploring in some ways the different forms <laughs> and let's hear uh, some of them well, some of them um, uh, to be leader is to be visionary it's to create a future that's different than where we are and the risk is that you're written off that people treat you as an idle visionary and, and, and uh, as irrelevant and that's painful to be treated as irrelevant even though your vision may be uh, very, very uh, appropriate. Um, that to be about changing systems and structures is risky because uh, people have invested a lot and it shakes the foundation of the organization and the way people think about the organization. And so you invite a less than uh, sociable response when you confront and begin to push. And, uh, and there are real risks associated with that. Uh, you can lose your job. You can, I mean, there's risks involved, and so the question becomes, what do I care enough about now? The other side of it is that a lot of the risks that we feel are more emotional risks. They're about my deep dependency. I want you to like me. I want you to love me. I want you to think highly of me, and if I confront you, you might not. And so... That could probably be applied to the family situation, yes. too. You think of parents today beating but, their heads against the wall, trying to keep some standards for their kids and, and feeling this great uh, tug of consumerism and the kids wanting to go their own way. And if they're going to really be any kind of a role model, it's like a, it has to be strong. There's a lot of suffering involved in that these days. You've got to yep. keep trying to stand up for what you think is right and what your values are and, and right. fight against the cultural consumerism that can take 
take over the younger generation right. and the individualism that is so strong. I mean, I talk to parents and say, you get worn out doing that. I mean, that's a suffering task, a yep. thankless task, because they say, well, so-and-so's mother lets her do that. How come I yeah. can't do that? And you're just in a constant tug that way. The pain of the whole notion of tough love, you know, and the parents who are struggling with substance abuse and, and the, the confront, the pushing they, that they need to do that, that is so threatening because it, the fear is that I'll be rejected by my own child. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, that's the suffering side of the service. It's like there's a part of it's worth pouring myself out for and, and it hurts and there's risks and... I suppose you could uh, think of pastors of parishes and pastoral leadership leaders these days who who could attest to the suffering side of all of this as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, they would say, you know, geez, I, I give of myself, and a lot of people don't respect that. Uh, people don't appreciate the role that I have. People uh, never really enough. fight against me, and I hit it from the right and the left. So there's a certain suffering for yeah. anybody who stands up and tries to exercise leadership and provide a vision and empower others. Yeah. You can. You can see it happening. I think you can see it in the corporate world. Uh, people in danger, I suppose, of being stepped on if they try to be too humane in what they are about. All leader pastor is a great example. Followers have such great expectations of pastors to take care of them, to provide, to give the direction, uh, and, and expectations that can never be met. And so, so one of the suffering forms is that they that, that there's never enough. I mean, it's like you know. I bet political leaders feel that way too. You know, they yeah. think, "Geez, I give of myself, and I'm my constituents don't really realize how much I'm working, and here I end up getting uh, called to task and not appreciated." Bob, we could talk forever about this, but uh, we need to wrap up here. And we're talking about leadership, and we can see it in so many uh, different ways. The leadership provides vision for us; it empowers us. And leadership also as the suffering servant. In the Christian setting, we put forward Jesus of Nazareth the greatest leader who ever lived, knew how to deal with people. And how consistent love for others, self-sacrificing love. It took him to the cross. He gave himself for the cause, the cause of the kingdom of God. And I think whether you're a parent or a manager or in a hospital union, school teacher, uh, pastoral leader in a parish, all of us can look at Christ and find